Good evening, everyone. <laughs> this is me. This is normal me. I feel like whenever I'm on the shade and another person comes out. Okay. We are going to get into the Word of God now. Are you ready? Yes. So I, first of all, would just like to honor my amazing pastors. Thank you so much for being the amazing pastors that you are. Can we give them a round of applause? Amen. And I'm just going to start off in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we're so grateful for the privilege and honor that we have to look at your word, to read your word, for your word. And we just ask that as we dive into it right now, that you would open it up to us, that you would build up our faith, and that truly tonight we would leave here not just having attended a church service, but Father, that our, our very being would have been encouraged, would have been um, built up, that our faith would go to a new level. And we just thank you so much for this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to talk about how to overcome evil in the world. How to overcome evil in the world. We all agree the world is evil, right? It's very evil. But I'm not just going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to overcome evil in the world, starting with yourself. How to overcome evil in the world, starting with yourself. Now, I would just like to do a um, free myself of plagiarism right now. All of what, not all, most of what I'm going to be speaking about tonight is what was on the amazing situation room today. And honestly, I can say, so our pastor is so faithful. He brings out an episode of the situation room every single day without fail. It doesn't matter if he's sick. It doesn't matter if he's tired. It doesn't matter if he's sick and tired. The situation room will continue. And really, it's an, it's an amazing program because, first of all, he, he, ups, he updates us on current world affairs. But at the same time, he gives you the good news. And, you know, I often, I edit, and I often sit editing and I'm encouraged because of the word that is spoken. So I really want to encourage you, if you haven't been watching The Situation Room, to listen to it because it really is powerful. And one of my favorite parts of The Situation Room is every Friday, he shares a testimony. And they're always amazing testimonies. But today he shared, today, yes, today, he shared this testimony. And I actually wanted to share it um, with all of you. And basically, there was a Muslim man that lived in Pakistan. So a Muslim man lived in Pakistan, and he converted to Christianity. But now, if you understand, Pakistan is a major Muslim country. So that would have been a huge issue. And so it was quite a drastic change. Obviously, people had an issue with him, had an issue with the fact that he had converted. But anyway, he didn't stay quiet about his conversion. He actually started winning other Muslims to God. Now, the, the amount, the danger that you put yourself in as a Muslim or an uh, ex-Muslim, I'm like pre-Muslim, no, before Muslim, that ex-Muslim, to now preach to Muslims is very dangerous because they will literally kill you. They will go that far for their belief in Islam. But he started winning other Muslims to God and God would open up doors so that he could witness in his community. Now, it's, very, it's, it's customary in that part of the world that marriages are prearranged at birth. And the first time he saw his wife was at the altar. In other words, the first time he saw his wife ever was when the two of them were making their wedding vows. So he hadn't seen his wife before then because it was a prearranged marriage. And so he marries her at the altar, seeing her for the first time. After three months of marriage, she realizes that he doesn't follow Islam, that he follows a different religion. And this freaks her out. So she decides to return to her father. She leaves him and returns to her father, who is very upset about the whole situation. Once again, putting him in huge danger. And for many years, the two of them were separated by her choice. Now, I want you to imagine... There is pain that comes through that separation. He was rejected by someone, someone who was supposed to be the love of his life. I know it's a prearranged marriage, but do you understand what I'm saying? They'd been married for three months, and now she chooses to leave him and go back to her father's house. And one day after living with her parents for a long time, her parents forced her to return back to him. So she goes back to him, and sometime later, she decides to poison his food. His wife decides to poison his food. 
When he gets home from work, he sits down to eat, but he had a habit of dipping some bread in curry and feeding it to their dog every time before he ate. So he did that that day, and after doing that, he then got up to wash his hands. And when he walked back in the room, the dog obviously had eaten it, but was now vomiting and couldn't walk. And he realized that there was something wrong with the food. He then looked at his wife and saw that she was notably disturbed and afraid, and he realized that she had tried to poison him. So not only had this chick left you, now she's in your house cooking you food and poisoning your food. Like, just put yourself in the situation for a moment. He asked her, why did you do that? Why did you poison my food? And she doesn't answer him. She keeps quiet. He was so angry that he wanted to beat her, which I must be quite honest in that moment, if we think about it, you're like, yeah, Yeah, no, I'm joking, don't beat women. But in that moment, what she did deserved his wrath. But instead of beating her, instead of doing that, he prayed and said to God, Lord, do not allow me to do this. And I love that prayer because it shows his vulnerability and it shows his dependency on God. He doesn't say, Lord, strike her down. He doesn't say, Lord, get her out of my house. He says, Lord, do not allow me to do this. He doesn't pray for her. He prays for him. He prays that he would have self-control in that moment. So he then decides to take her back to her parents' home and tells her when he was leaving her there, he said to her, don't kill me. If you don't want to live with me, I understand, but don't kill me, which I think is a very gracious response to everything that she had done for him, to him, sorry. He then continued to seek God and pray for her. This doesn't make sense. He continues to seek God and pray for her. And after a while, he actually found out that she was pregnant. She had actually fallen pregnant. And he asked God to speak to her in dreams and tell her to come back home. He asked God to speak to her in dreams and tell her to come back home. In 2001, the Lord revealed himself to, his, to her, his wife, in a vision and told her, go and follow the God your husband follows. So she returned to her husband and told him that God had revealed himself to her. And then after having their second child, so that was their first child, after having their second child, she was actually left unconscious after the delivery, and the Lord spoke to her again. Talk about God answering a prayer that was prayed ages ago that you thought even was answered, but answering it again when she's given birth a second time. And he said to her, you are giving birth to this baby, but I long to give you a new birth. I want you to be born again. She then asked her husband about this, because technically the statement, be born again, is a very odd statement if you don't know the context behind it. So she asks her husband about this, and he told her that God wanted her to follow him, to follow God with all her heart, and she actually surrendered her life completely to the Lord, and now, his words, is an excellent wife, yes, this is the woman that tried to poison him to death, is an excellent wife and supports him in the ministry, and he is now a Christian pastor in Pakistan. And this is what my dad said, and I love this, he said, He, the the Christian pastor, had to overcome the evil in himself when his wife tried to poison him. We go, yeah, she's so evil, she tried to kill him. And yes, that is a very evil thing to do. But the fact that he wanted to beat her, there was evil inside of him. There was evil intent inside of him. And he had to overcome the evil. And once he overcame that evil, not only was he able to minister to her, but he probably ministered to her family as well. And how many people now in Pakistan, and no one can come and say, you're you're a Christian, but I heard that you once beat your wife. No one can say that of him because he didn't do that. He overcame the evil within himself, and as a result, it had an impact on the evil that was in the world. We can overcome evil within ourselves and affect other people just because of what we have overcome in ourselves. And he, as a result, got a wife that supports him in the ministry. 
This is how we overcome evil in the world. Not by focusing on what everyone else is doing wrong and throwing holy water and having signs that say turn and burn and judging it. That's not how we overcome evil in the world. We overcome evil in the world by overcoming evil within ourselves, but that takes faith. I want you to think about it. This guy is a, is a Christian in a, in a Muslim country. That's very, very dangerous. His wife is trying to kill him. That's very dangerous. I think it's more dangerous for, for a wife to want to kill you than your husband. A woman's wrath is a terrible thing, you know. But his wife wants to kill him. And he had to, in that moment, go, I trust you, God. I trust that if I follow what your word says, I don't know how, but you will work everything out. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't look it looks like I'm going to be dead in the next three months, to be quite honest. But I trust, I have faith that you will work things out. And we have to have faith. It will only happen. Evil will only be overcome if we have faith. And it also will only happen if we do what God wants us to do. You cannot say you have faith if you are disobedient to the Lord. Because your faith is proved in your obedience to God. Your faith is proved in what you do. If he beats her and then said, oh, I believe you, Lord. I believe that you are. That, do you understand what I'm saying? It wouldn't have made sense. And I teach life class on a Thursday. And the one, the one lesson I was speaking about is the fact that you have to accept God's forgiveness. So God wants to forgive you, but you have to accept it. And someone then put up their hand. I hate it when people put up their hands and ask questions because I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to answer them. So he puts up his hand, and I'm like, yes. And he says, how do I accept God's forgiveness? forgiveness? And I'm like, oh, no, this is not in the notes. Why? Lord, help me. And the Lord helped me, thank God, <laughs> you know, because it wouldn't be good teaching life class. And you're like, I don't know, but you need to do it, you know. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense. And in that moment, God actually spoke to me, and my answer was, you have to believe that he has forgiven you. Acceptance comes through your faith in his forgiveness. You can be a Christian and not believe that God has forgiven you. So, acceptance of God's forgiveness is because of your faith. Everything in Christianity is because of your faith. Do you believe that God can forgive you? Do you believe that God wants to forgive you? Do you believe that, do you have faith? And the conquering power, the conquering power that brings the world to its knees with all the evil, with all of the injustice, the conquering power is not nuclear missiles. It is faith. Our faith conquers the whole world. The whole world is conquered simply by our faith. Now, maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're going, I don't have faith that can conquer the world. If, if, if I was being poisoned, I might give up Jesus. If someone pointed a gun to my head, think about it. If someone literally walked in here and pointed a gun straight at your head and said to you, if you don't give up Jesus, I will shoot you. And you know they're going to do it. What are you going to do? I know we all want to say, shoot me. But in that moment, will you say, shoot me? Or will you go, okay, it's fine. I give up Jesus. Where is your faith? How do we build our faith? Well, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and it comes by hearing the word of God. The word of God, the Bible, is what builds our faith. And I want to just show you a quick example of how the Bible built my faith in a specific struggle that I was going through. So a couple of months ago, it was the beginning of the month, and I had run out, I was on a, I'd basically had very little money left, very, and it was the beginning of the month, it wasn't even mid-month, like beginning of the month, life had happened, stuff had happened, expenses had come, and it was just, there was no money, and I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. I actually don't know what to do in this moment. And I kept feeling that God was saying to me, take the little that you have and give all of it to the church. Now, that does not make any sense in the natural. It really doesn't. In the natural, it makes sense to hold on to that money and spend it very carefully and try and stretch it to the end of the month, which wasn't possible. But that is, at the end of the day, what we want to do in our human nature. And I was like, Lord, if you want me to do this, you have to, like, I have to know for a fact. 
And the next day, Tando actually did the offer tree, and her offer tree was so encouraging to me. And I felt through her offer tree reading, God was prompting me once again. I think, in fact, she even had a story of a man who was in my situation and how God was faithful to him. And so that night, I went home, and in my room, I decided to spend some time with God and to find promises in the Bible that would give me the faith I needed to, to do this, to take everything that I had left and give it to the church. And I found four verses. You know all of these verses, but I want to read them. Matthew 6, verse 33 in the Passion says, So above all, constantly seek God's kingdom and His righteousness. Then these less important things, money, will be given to you. But it doesn't doesn't stop there. It says, will be given to you abundantly. And I love that because I felt God was saying to me, I will not only give you what you need, I will give you what you need abundantly. Then Malachi 3, verse 8 to 11, Tabo actually read this in the offer tree. It says, test me in this. God literally gave me this verse. Test me in this, God speaking, and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. And then this verse, Tando actually read in her offer reading, and it was Isaiah 65, verse 24. And it says this, I will answer them before they even call me. I will answer them. So God, was, God literally was saying to me, I've already answered you before you even prayed, before you even knew that you were going to have an issue with money. I've already answered you. And then it says, while they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. And those four verses gave me the faith, gave me the courage to take all of that money that I had and to give it to the church. So I did it. I sowed it into the church. And I cannot tell you how God has blessed me in the last couple of months. I cannot tell you how He has opened up doors financially that don't even make sense. They honestly don't make I'm still like, really? But God has opened up doors so much that not only do I have what I need, but I honestly have an abundance of what I need. And I believe that God will still continue to answer that prayer, just like that the, the, the preacher from Pakistan, he had prayed a prayer, and after his wife gave birth to their second child, God still answered that prayer that was prayed when she fell pregnant with their first child. And so, I, want, I, this, I would love for this to be said of me, and let this be said of all of us. And this is, imagine someone put a plaque over your head and it says, all that happened in my life brought about spiritual maturity and complete dependence on God. That's faith. Faith is when you are completely dependent on God. Not, I'm dependent on a Sunday. I'm dependent when I'm sick. I'm dependent when I'm depressed. I'm sometimes dependent. I don't know if God will answer my, no, I, I am always, I am completely dependent on God. If God doesn't do it, I'm stuffed. Like that Muslim man, if God didn't save him, he was dead. He, he should have been dead. But God worked for him, and that is faith, complete dependence on God. And Isaiah 30 verse 18 in the message says this, and this, this is such a beautiful verse, especially for building faith. It says, but God's not finished. Doesn't matter what your life looks like. Doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter what the doctor said. It doesn't matter what your teacher said. It doesn't matter what your parents said. God's not finished. God is not finished. It doesn't matter if there was a pandemic. It doesn't matter if they're planning another pandemic. God is not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. He's waiting. He's literally like, okay, wait, she's coming and gracious. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. He's focused on being gracious to you. And it says he's gathering strength to show mercy to you. God takes the time to do everything right. Everything. And then I love this. This I love. Those who wait around for him are the lucky ones. Those who wait around for him are the lucky ones. And that's so, it's so encouraging because life sometimes... (laughs) <laughs> you're just like, okay, Lord, I, the, the best days really were behind me. I'm just going to, you know, like try and stay positive and get to heaven. You know, that's my game plan. But no, God's saying, why? I'm not finished. Why? Wait, wait for me. Yes, you might have to be patient, but patience builds faith. That's why God doesn't answer your prayers immediately because none of us would have faith. 
One minute late, God's not gonna, he did it. Right, I don't have faith in ESCOM. We had load shedding and the power was supposed to come back and it didn't. And I was like, we're not gonna have power for the next four hours. That's what we look like as Christians because God doesn't answer you that day or God didn't answer you two weeks later or God wait and you will be lucky. Only the people that wait are lucky. Why? Because as they were waiting, they were building their faith. Waiting means you're waiting. It doesn't mean you've given up. You're waiting. It means you might not have it, but you're waiting. You're ready for it. People who don't wait walk away. They find other solutions. Wait, and then you will be lucky. And so I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And I'm just going to ask if I'm going to do two altar calls. The first is if you have no faith or if your faith is there, but it really isn't strong, and you want to come back to God, remember, we need to ask God to help us. The, the preacher said, Lord, don't allow me to do this. We have to ask God. We have to be dependent on God. And if you want to give your life to God tonight, if you want to commit your life to Him, if you want to be born again, that doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. That means God's going to be with you in the tough times, which is way better than doing it by yourself. If that is you tonight, I'm just going to ask you to raise up your hand. And all that, there's going to be people coming around. They're going to give you a pamphlet just so that we can be in contact with you. But if anyone here tonight wants to give their life, wants to renew their faith, just raise up your hand right now. And we're just going to do a simple prayer. Thank you. I already see hands going up. If that's you, just raise your hand as a sign to God saying, Lord, I, I need you. I want you. I'm not too proud to go, oh, I'm fine. I don't need God. No, I need you, God. Please help me. If I said, who wants a free iPhone? Put up your hand right now. Everyone would be like, me. It's the same with salvation. And salvation is more than that. If you want salvation, put up your hand right now. And we're going to pray together and God will save you. He loves you and He wants to forgive you, but you have to ask Him to forgive you. And so right now, as a sign of faith, just raise up your hand. I'm going to ask that we all pray together, and then afterwards we're going to do a second prayer. But for those who have raised up their hand, that this is an awesome decision. Congratulations. This is the best decision you will ever make in your entire life. And I know that God will bless you, that He will bless your family, that He will bless the world because you have decided to choose him tonight. And so let's just pray together. Father God, come on, say it passionately. Father God, I need you. I am a sinner. I am unholy. I even want to do evil. But I need you. I want you. I accept your forgiveness tonight. Thank you that you were willing to die for me that you would rather die than not have me in your life. And so tonight, I declare that you are my Lord and Savior, that you are my God. I choose to follow you. And I thank you that your love for me is so great. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to do the declaration from the Situation Room. Yes, this is the Situation Room part two for today. So we're going to do the declaration and then we're going to do the prayer together. And this is really powerful. And you know, I don't know if you know this. I remember my mom, my mom once did an episode of Are You Up Babes where she spoke about the fact that water responds to the spoken word. Water will change based on the spoken word. I don't know the science behind it. If you want to go, go Google. But Water actually responds to spoken word. And our bodies are made up of more than 70% of water, which means there is water inside of us <laughs> that if we speak will change. Do you understand what I'm saying? The spoken word is so powerful and these declarations are so powerful. I would encourage you to go and get these declarations and write them down and confess them every day because we need to start speaking the word of God because hearing the word of God builds our faith. So speak it. You don't need a pastor. You can speak the word. And so we're going to declare this together. The declaration says, by faith, I know God as my father, Jesus as my savior, and the Holy Spirit as my counselor. Are you ready? 
We're going to say this passionately. So say, by faith, I know God as my Father, Jesus as my Savior, and the Holy Spirit as my Counselor. And now I'm going to ask us to close our eyes, and we're going to do the prayer together. And I'm going to ask you to really just pray this with all of your might. Speak directly to God right now. Let's say it together. Say, my Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to redeem me. Now my nature has been transformed by faith. My nature has been transformed by faith. Thank you for sending the wonderful Holy Spirit to live in my heart. Thank you for allowing me to share in your nature. I love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. And so this is my last ad for the Situation Room. Guys, go watch the Situation Room. It's awesome. Man. What's wrong with you? No, I'm joking. But we will see you Sunday and we will see you Monday for the Situation Room, right? Yes. <laughs>